Thanks for joining us online today. You're gonna to hear a message right now from one of our pastors. Here at Destiny, we're Church of Steps. We believe that God wants to take you from where you are to where he wants you to be. And so as you listen to this message, we pray that it would encourage you, inspire you, and show you what God can do in your life. Now sit back and enjoy this message. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Romans, starting in chapter 1, verse 13. We've been on a series entitled, Until Now. Until now. And it reads like this. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now. In order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. We heard that Paul had a burning desire to get a message to the Gentiles. He knew he had to get to Rome, and, and there was something that was burning inside of him. And he says, listen, I've had some setbacks until now. And I love how this text begins to open up. And today, as we begin to go even deeper in the Word of God in this series, I truly believe that this is a word uh, that would stir you to your core. For those of you who are church, it's going to be great. For those of you who are unchurched and those watching online, it's going to be great. So let's just dive into the word of God as we pray. Father, I thank you for who you are. I thank you that your word is alive and well. I pray tonight that your word would begin to stir in the hearts of all of your children, that they would allow your words to be etched on their hearts like tattoos. I pray, Father, that after they hear this message, the good news that their life would never be the same again. We give you permission, Father, to show up and show out. Use me as a conduit. I stand as a pen in the hand of a ready writer. Let us enjoy this time together. In Jesus' name. And everyone say, amen. Give somebody a high five and say, get ready, get ready, get ready. So we've been in this series entitled Until Now. And, and, and I shared with it is oftentimes when you look at Paul and to understand his life, we're going to go a little deeper into it. But there's this burning passion that we've read about Paul. How he had this burning desire in his heart to, to move forward with this news that he found out. He, he found some good news that would begin to stir him on the inside. It was the news of Jesus. And it compelled him to a place to where he now said, listen, I was held up. Until now, I got to get to you because there's something here. And when you look at Paul's life, it, you would think even in his life, like, man, wow, that, that's a great way for us to go ahead and have outreach. And now as you look at social media, if you guys have Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, you come across some, some different ways that people choose to share the message of God. Now, now some of these ways, you just got to look at yourself and, and be like, really? Like, this is what you want to do? I just took some pictures of stuff that, that, that people tagged me in to let me know that they love Jesus. And this is the first one I have. Y'all got to take a look at this. Look at this. <laughs> Catch up with Jesus. Let us praise and relish him because he loves me from my head to my toes. <laughs> they hit me with that. Go ahead. Let's go to the next one. Take a look at this one. These are the different type of people. Hey, bro, do you even lift? His name on high. This is, this, these are the type of people who you know they get saved and they coming at you and they just intense. You in the gym trying to work out, hit your set, and they trying to just witness to you. Yo, can I get my set in? Are we good? Different ones to do that. And then, that, and then those people who kind of scroll through your, your Instagram feed and they feel like you're not holy enough, they may send you something that looks like this. <laughs> How you look trying to hide sin from God. Like, you know, you got some dirt in your life and you can't hide it. I see it. Because I love Jesus. Take a look at this next one. This is, this is, you know, you get these people right here. <laughs> Bless the Lord, <laughs> oh my soul. There it is right there. They just find any reason to start praising Jesus. These are the type of people that want to let you know that they love Jesus. And, and when I look at that, I look at this, and it's so funny to laugh at the way that they do it, and it's so nonchalant. But Paul had a different way that he went about it. You see, Paul was in this mindset where he says, I've got to get something to you because it's something that will change your life. Paul was a little more aggressive in the way that he went about what he went about. When you look at the life of Paul, you see that there's something about Paul in his life that allows him to say, listen, I've been beat three different times and been whipped 39 times. I've been shipwrecked three different times. I've been stoned. I've been beaten. I've been jumped. And all of this because I was trying to get this message 
to the Gentiles. There, there was something about Paul that put a fire inside of his life that caused him to want to push forward even when he's getting pushed back. And, and, and when you look at that, you would say to yourself, okay, well, how, how passionate was Paul? Paul says it like this in Romans 1.16. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power, everyone say power, of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now to understand this even more, you would say to yourself, if someone says, I'm unashamed of the gospel of Christ. Do you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? If you die today, do you know where you're going? You know, you get those people who are unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you would look at Paul and say, man, Paul must have been one of those people who grew up in the church. Like, you know, those, those Christians who've been saved their whole life, like saved, saved their whole life. And you would expect somebody like that to say, man, I'm unashamed of the gospel. I'll die for the gospel. And you see Paul in this condition. And you would think, hey, he grew up in the church. But on the contrary, before Paul was Paul, his name was Saul. And to understand Saul, you have to understand who he was. He was a bad brother. He was a mean guy. You see, Saul came from a long lineage of Pharisees. And it only would seem right that he would become one himself. And so he sat under one of the greatest rabbinical teachers of that time, Gamaliel. And as he learned from him, this was the man who, 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 who had all the greatest knowledge. He was the greatest rabbi in all of Israel at that time. So now Saul learned from the best. And to understand that the Pharisees were one of the strictest, strictest sects that was there in Judaism. They would look at their lifestyle of how they lived and, and they were different from the Sadducees. They focused on your everyday living. They would look at you and say, oh, you didn't observe this and you didn't observe that. Therefore, you're not as good as us. We are the Pharisees. We are the ones that have it all together. We have been learned and educated. And when you look at the life of Saul, he had been so educated and so well brought up that it was just in him. And he gets word of this new religion called Christianity. And it begins to bother him. He, he, he hears this idea that there's some savior that dies on this cross and he claims to be the son of God. And you mean to tell me that the way that you get saved is that you have to confess and believe in your heart that he is the son of God and now you're good? No man can be good. It's impossible to believe that a savior can come and change you from your situation and your circumstance that easy. It was something that bothered him because you see, they grew up knowing that it was by our works. We got to keep this law. It's things that we do. And if you don't do what we do, there's no way that anybody can save you, let alone this man who proclaims that he is the son of God. He hated Christianity. It was in the core of who he was to destroy anything and everyone who would claim to believe in what he called the way. So when you look at Saul and you look at that being his forefront in his life, and now we fast forward and his name is now Paul, you have to understand that the original context of what Saul wanted to do is Saul wanted to put shame on all those who would claim that they were Christians. He wanted you to look into a place where you would begin to feel ashamed for what you believe in. In other words, shame on you. Shame on you. Shame on you for believing such a crazy story. Shame on you for believing that your Savior can save you. Shame on you. You want to know what I, the crazy thing about shame is? Is do you notice it's something that you put on? Or someone puts on you? You notice it's not shame in you, it's shame on you. That means that somebody's trying to make you feel bad for a decision or a choice that you're choosing to walk in. Somebody is trying to make you feel bad for a decision of changing your life. Isn't it amazing how when you're out in the world and you're doing reckless things that nobody looks at you like anything's wrong? 
Y'all can talk to me. It's Sunday night. When you're out there being reckless and you're around all of your friends, nobody said anything and you know you were acting crazy. But the moment you mention the name of Jesus, all of a sudden you become the weirdo. Oh, my life has changed now. I'm following the word of God. Oh, gosh, here you go. You're going to be one of those Jesus freaks. You mention the name of Jesus, and now there's a problem. Shame on you. But Saul goes from a place of trying to bring shame on those who are of the way to now in Romans 1.16 saying, I am unashamed of the gospel of Christ. If you start thinking in yourself, you got to start wondering, man, what was it that took a man from wanting to place shame on you for wanting to change your life and your situation to now saying, I'm unashamed of the very thing that I tried to shame you of? What happened in his life? I want to give you tonight, in the next 23 minutes and 43 seconds, the key words that begin to change and transform Saul into Paul. What took him from having shame and trying to place it on everybody else to now saying that I'm unashamed? If we look at the text, the text almost becomes like the Da Vinci Code, the movie. The codes are all there in front of you, but you got you to gotta work it a little bit. You have to work the text. You have to interrogate the text. And I truly believe that in Romans 1, what we see as we begin to exposit this scripture is you begin to see the secrets of what lie within the text that would give us the answers of what brought him to a place where he was unashamed. The first thing that we have to understand is that Paul came into a context where he came into real power. <laughs> the first word is power. He says, for I am unashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power. Everyone say power. power. It is the power of God. What he came first in contact with with his life was a power, and it was a power that was greater than him. The Greek word power is dunamis, which we get the word dynamite from. It was a power that was an explosive power. And when he talks about this word, he says, I am unashamed of the gospel. What the gospel is, it's the good news. But how many of you know in order for you to have good news, there's got to be bad news. And the bad news is that he knew and he recognized that all of us has fallen short. All of us have missed the mark. All of us have been born into sin. And now we could not do anything within our own power to get us back into the relationship with God. Bad news. But the good news was is that there was a man by the name of Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins resurrected on the third day, snatched the keys from hell and put us back in relationship with God, not just so we can do it, but so that we can have power. There's power in the name of Jesus. When he's talking about the gospel, what he's trying to let us know is that there is a power. I'm unashamed of the power, the dunamis power of God because the gospel, when I read the word of God and I accept the message of Jesus, it gives me power in my life. Power. Nobody wakes up and says, man, I can't wait to be weak today. We have trainers in the building who will vouch. No one will say like, oh my gosh, I know I can push up this way, but those fives look really good right now. Nobody puts on a dream board and, and on their dream board they have the picture of their body and then they want somebody who's looking frail and sick. Nobody wants to be weak. Everybody wants to have power. And what we find out in the story of Saul is that he comes face to face with a power that was greater than him. Look at what the text says in Acts 9. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He was so angry, he wasn't talking about it, he was breathing it. <laughs> he was breathing murderous threats. He was so angry that it came out of him like breath. You know, certain people, just negativity comes out of them like breath. Things that, that of, of lack and, and these words and all of these things just come out of him like breath. He was in this place and even in his breath, these murderous threats were coming out about these Christians who claimed to be of the way. 
And as he's there, he's riding on his horse, and as he's on his way to Damascus to, to, to place all of those Christians who are of the way in chains, and there's a bright light that comes, and it knocks him off of his horse. And in verse 4, it says, he fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? There was a power, watch this, remember the word was dunamis. There was a power that knocked him off of his position and put him into a place where he can begin to hear the voice of God. When we look at the gospel and we hear what Jesus does, oftentimes what it does is it knocks us off of where we are and places us in a position where we can hear his voice. And sometimes what happens is he allows his power to hit us and overwhelm us at times so it allows us to stop hearing all the voices of everybody else and hear his voice. It's the dunamis power of God. It's the power of the gospel. It's when I read the Bible, it takes me from a place where he's writing and thinking he's going and doing the right thing. And he thinks he's doing God a favor. And he thinks everything is okay until he hits something in his life. And he comes face to face with the power of God. And that's what happens in the message of Jesus. For many of you, you've been in a place where you've been on your own ride, going your own route. And all of a sudden, you get hit with the power of God that knocks you off of your high horse and brings you to a place to where now you can begin to hear the voice of God. Paul came face to face with the power of God. Can I tell you that when God gives us power, do you recognize it's just not for us to walk around and say, I got the power. <laughs> it's not for you to walk around and be like, yo, I, I got it. I got the power of God in my life. Let me tell you what the power is. It says it like this. It says, for I am unashamed of the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ. I'm ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God unto salvation. The power of God gives us the ability to begin to receive salvation. Salvation comes from another root word, which means Savior. So why would he first mention power and then go into salvation? It's because I can't save you if I don't have the power to do so. In order for me to be a Savior, that means I have to have the power to pull you out of a situation that you can't pull yourself out of. And Saul found himself in a position that he could not pull himself out of his condition of his sin. As a matter of fact, no man could. But when Jesus came and died on the cross, he exercised a power to pull us out of the sins of our lives and pull us out and into a brand new life. He had power to save. If we look at the life of Saul in this moment, you can actually begin to see our steps here at Destiny. You know how we talk about what we believe. We're a church of steps. And how God will move you from where you are to where he wants you to go. Well, how does he do it? He meets you where you are. He'll move you to where you need to be. He'll make you into who he's called you to be so that he can multiply your life. Meet, move, make, and multiply. If you allow me for these couple of minutes, I want to show you where this happens on the conversion of Saul's life. Can I do that for you guys? The first thing that he does is he meets him. In Acts 9, 5, it says, Then the Lord said, Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. Then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. He met him right then and there. Right after the explosion hits, the power of God hits him, he meets him right there where he's at. The next thing that he begins to do is we said that he wants to move you. And in Acts 9, 6, the next verse, it says, Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. He moved him. He took him from a place where he just met him, and then he moved him. When you come here and you come on a Sunday or you come on a Wednesday, what we do is we want to give you every opportunity to meet Jesus face to face. But it's not just enough for us to have you meet him. We want to move you. And notice that it wasn't a later move, it was an immediate move. Which is why when you hear Pastor Obed talk about it, or you hear our pastors talk, we say immediately what you need to do is get into family reunion. Why? Because if you stay stagnant too long, like Pastor Andrew said, and you don't unwrap what's been on you, the tomb starts looking very comfortable in your life. And so we want to immediately move you to a place where after he's met you, he moves you into a place called family reunion here. And this is what he did with Saul. He says, look, you can't stay where you're at. I have to move you now. Arise and go, and I will tell you what to do. If you're in a place in your life right now, and you're asking God 
God, what do I do? I don't know where to go. <laughs> My first question I have is, have you met him? Because you can't get the direction on what you must do until you've met the one who's in your situation. And even if you are saved, you don't just meet him one time. <laughs> you meet him every day. You meet him in every single moment. When he says, arise, that means get up from the condition that you're at. You weren't saved to sit. You're saved to serve. And what God saved you from, watch this, pales in comparison to what he saved you for. And so what he's saying is, arise, get up from where you've been at. I've got some place for you to go. He moved him. And now as he's moved, here's what happens. As he stands up, there are scales that fall over Saul's eyes. He can't see. And as these scales are coming over his eyes, all of a sudden, God is giving him visions of his life, of where he's supposed to go. And what's going to happen, that this man is going to touch you and your scales are going to fall off. And at the same time, at the same time, in Damascus, he's talking to a man by the name of Ananias. And he says to Ananias, he says, Ananias, in 915, look what it says. But the Lord said to him, go... For he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentile kings and children of Israel. God tells Ananias, listen, there's a man that I want you to go lay hands on. And when you go lay hands on him, the scales will begin to fall off his eyes. Now, you got to understand my brother's response. He goes, sure, God, send me, I'll go. <laughs> What's his name? <laughs> God says, his name is Saul. Wait, what? Hold on. <laughs> Lord, you know I really serve you like I'm really saved. Do you recognize that he's coming out here to put all of us in prison? And you want me to run to him? I'm trying to run from the brother. And he tells him, no, I need you to go because he is a chosen vessel. What caught me and really just began to mess with my mind is I said, wait, God, you met him, Jesus. Then you moved him. But how can you move him and put scales on his eyes? Have you ever been in a place where now you meet Jesus and now he's moving you, but it seems like everything's blind in your life? Because I begin to realize that once he does that, what he says is, I need you to trust on my voice rather than what you see. Because I'm moving you from a place of where you've been to a place that you haven't been. You've relied on everybody else's voice and you've been relying on what you've seen to tell you what you're supposed to do. So I need to blind you so that you can hear my voice. He says, I will tell you what you need to do. And so he tries to make his way over there. Like, I would have paid just to see him try to get to Damascus blind like that. And he gets there, and Ananias places his hand on him, and immediately the scales fall off. And look what happens. Watch this. He says, he is a chosen vessel of mine. Can I tell you something? You're chosen. You're not here by mistake. You were chosen. Before you breathed your first breath, you were chosen. You look at your life and people want to place shame on you for the business that you have and the success you have. Can I tell you something? You were chosen. People want to look at your situation and say, how could they get there? You can just look them in the face and say, I'm chosen. He was a chosen vessel that God would begin to use to bring the gospel, the good news to somebody who was in need. That was the good news. That somebody was in need and he was chosen to bring it to the Gentiles but not just the Gentiles he was chosen to bring it before kings as well can I tell you something that your life and what you got saved from is not just supposed to be the area that you hang out in and try to save those people because God is trying to move you from what he saved you from to what he saved you for. Which means is that you'll move, you may have started off here, but he's going to move you to a place of influence where you'll be around kings. And you'll be around people of influence. Begin to share this word of what he's done in your life. And guess what? The gospel is an equalizer. The gospel is for everyone. The good news is from everyone, not just the down and outs, but the up and ups. The gospel is no respecter of persons. It's for everyone. And Paul got this in his spirit and said, oh my gosh, I got this news. I, I, I got this word that I have to say. I am obligated to share it with somebody. I'm obligated 
to share it with somebody because maybe somebody's in need of saving. You know, if I began to study about the Titanic, and what I found out about the Titanic is, is that it wasn't the iceberg that actually sunk the Titanic. What it was is that they were, the captains of the Titanic were given three different messages, warning, iceberg ahead, warning, iceberg ahead, warning, iceberg ahead. And what they did is they looked and they said, oh, it doesn't look that bad, so we're not going to tell the people who need to know. So they kept a warning from people who really needed to know it, and in the end it cost 1,500 people their lives. What makes the matter even crazier is that all of the boats except for six were only filled to half capacity. Because the people who were safe and saved, said, man, it's too much of a risk to go back and cause them to capsize our boat, so let's just keep going. And what strikes me and what was different between many of us and Paul is Paul says, no, 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 I understand that there's a risk involved, but the value of what I'm risking for is worth it. So I know that I'm going to have to risk some things in my life, but their life is worth it. I know that I got to risk people looking at me funny and looking at me strange, but the good news is worth it. I need to let them know that you've been caught up and you've been messed up, but there is a Savior who can save you, and his name is... Jesus, he says, I am obligated. I think that's the difference between a lot of us and them is that he had an obligation. If we were driving down our house and we looked at the neighborhoods around us and we saw our neighbor's house on fire, wouldn't you feel obligated to place a phone call? If it was your family's house, wouldn't you feel obligated to call the fire department and say, hey, listen, your house is on fire and try to do something to put it out? You want to know why? It's because we know the value of a home. And there are many of us who sit next to coworkers, who sit next to our family and go to barbecues and be around people their whole life and recognize that there's a flame that they're headed towards. But if we don't look at them as a person who has value, will act like those on the Titanic and just say a prayer for them. And Paul is at this place, he says, I'm compelled. There is a power that can save them from their depression. There's a power that can save them in their business. There's a power that can save their marriage. There's a power that can heal their children. There's a power that can take them in their lives and move them to a different direction. There is a saving dunamis power that can take them from their state that they could not bring themselves out of. This is the gospel. This is the good news. That you may be stuck in your own ways, but there's a God who's never stuck. The last thing he does is he multiplies. He met him, he moves him, he made him, and he multiplies. Look at what it says in Acts 9.31. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were what? I told you. Meet, move, make, multiply. The story of Saul's life. Well, what must I do now? What does this mean? Because, okay, I believe that there's power now. And I understand this power has the ability to bring me salvation, to save me from my condition or save my friends and my family from this condition. So what must I do? The word that he brings up, the next one is for those who believe. Do you notice he says everyone who believes? Look at what the scripture says. I love it. It says in Romans 10, 11 through 13, as scripture says, anyone who what? Believes, believes in him, meaning Jesus, will never be put to what? Oh, there it is again. The message was entitled, shame on you. But we realize that when I receive the gospel of Jesus Christ, I realize that it's no longer shame on me, it's shame off me. And what we read in the Bible of why we need this good news and why people need the good news is because the enemy's number one plot is to have us walking around feeling like we're in shame. But the gospel says, I'll take the shame off of you. 
For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. In other words, there's no difference between your status. There's no difference between your stature, your economic background, whether you have millions of dollars in your bank or whether you have nothing in your bank. Whether you've known this walk for a long time or heard it or not, there is no difference between where you are, regardless of your race, regardless of your color, regardless of any other. The gospel is for everyone. It's good news for everyone. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Not some, but all. Do you understand why Paul now had this drive to go to Rome? You have to understand Rome of that time. Rome was like the Malibu of that time. Rome was like the Orange County, the Newport Beach of that time. It was the up and up. It was the people who had it all together. If, if you will, it were the people who had multiple cars and, and, and they had extended vacations. This was the place where Rome was the happening place. As a matter of fact, some of the greatest philosophical teachers came out of that place. Aristotle, Plato, Socrates. And here he was trying to get to them and let them know, listen, I got this good news. And I realize that you don't have to be saved just off of your works because your works won't do it. But there was a man named Jesus, and if you just believe, there's dunamis power to save you from your condition. If you don't know Jesus, this is good news. If you know people who don't know Jesus, this is good news. This is why it's called the gospel, the good news. But here's the catch, and I'll be done. This is, this is my last point, and I'm in closing. The last word we find out that Paul lays up for us is righteousness. He says, for in the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as is written, the just shall live by faith, but watch what it says. I, I want you to catch this. We have to understand what righteousness is. Righteousness is not a condition, it's a position. Righteousness doesn't mean that you know every book of the Bible and you can recite every single scripture. That's not righteousness. What righteousness is, is another word that they talk about imputation. That means to take something off of one person and put it on somebody else. What Jesus did was he took the imputation of sin and he placed it on himself even though it wasn't his. So that we wouldn't have it on ourselves. And when he went through what he went through, it was because of what Jesus did on the cross that he took on our sins so that we can be seen sinless. In other words, sin was our condition, but a child of God was our position. And what he did was he took on our sins, which was our condition, to help change our position. We went from being a sinner disconnected from God to now coming in full close contact with God. Because of what he did on the Christ, because of his blood, we can now stand before God and say, I'm blameless because of your son Jesus if I believe. That's the gospel. In Psalm 34, it says it like this, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. <laughs> did you hear what I just said? The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. Have you ever been in a place where you say, God, don't you see my condition? God, don't you see what I've been going through? God, you don't see me? You're supposed to see everything. He says, no, no, no. The problem is, is I can't see you because all I see is your sin. But the moment that you receive my son Jesus, now I can see you because you're clothed in righteousness. It brings you into a place where he can see you. And that's why he says that the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. And his ears are attentive to their cry. Have you ever said, God, I feel like my prayers aren't going through? Have you ever said to God, I've been praying over and over and over again. He's asking you the question. It's not that I don't hear you. It's that your position is wrong. Because my daughter could be calling me from Camp Destiny right now. And it's not that daddy doesn't have the ability to hear her. It's just that she's in the wrong position. 
But the moment my daughter changes her position and comes into here, then daddy can hear what she's crying about, which was her condition, and then change the condition because she's changed her position. This is righteousness. Watch this, watch this, watch this. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from some of their troubles. 30% of their troubles. On a good day, you might get 60%. He says he delivers them from all their troubles. That's good news. I don't know about you, but to know that there's a God that takes all of my flaws and takes all of my sins and he sends his son to cover it all for my life so that I can be good and cover all of my troubles. That's good news. That's the gospel. And this is, I just want to tell you this story in closing. Do you recognize the word sin? You hear it, Pastor Obed talks about it all the time. Sin is an archery term. Which means to miss the mark. Didn't say that you're a terrible person. He says that you just missed the mark. It doesn't mean you're not trying. you just missing the mark. In other words, without Jesus in your life, you can try all you want, but you're still going to miss the you can have all of the abilities and have all the right tools and, and have the right business plan in front of you. But if Jesus isn't at the center of your relationship or your business, you can try again and again and again. And you're still going to come up short missing the mark. It would look something like this. Your life is the bullseye what God has for you. But we've tried in all of our own power and we've just simply missed the mark. I think about the woman with the issue of blood. For 12 years, she had a condition. And for 12 years, she pulled back these arrows and, and tried to shoot it at her condition, only to find out that she always missed the mark and that nobody could heal her, nobody can save her, nobody could help her. For 12 years, she missed the mark. 12 years with a condition. And she sat in her condition that caused her to lose her position. To be able to go and see a doctor for 12 years, y'all already know, even with insurance, she had to have some money. But after 12 years, she ran out. And some of us have been missing the mark for longer than 12 years in our energy, our strength, our faith has run out. She's sitting there, and she hears this word, though. She hears some good news. That there's a man by the name of Jesus who would be passing by. And she said to herself, I can sit here in my condition, or I can choose to change my position to get to the great physician. I'm going to say that again. I can sit in my condition, or I can change my position to get to the great physician physician and what happens is is the moment that she changed her position she went from sitting down to crawling through the crowd and she reached out to touch the hem of Jesus's garment and when she changed her position immediately her condition stopped this is the gospel that says I need to change my position of feeling like I have it all together or thinking, hey, I'm a good person. You probably are a good person. But good people don't make it to heaven. Saved people make it to heaven. And I know this messes with our theology a little bit because we say, God, I don't know how you can send a good person to hell. He says, I don't. I sent them my son. And the reality is the gospel says he can save us if we just change our position. The moment she changed her position, her life went from looking like she missed the mark to this. <laughs> Do you notice that the arrows aren't there? See, when we accept Jesus in our life, all the mistakes we made get removed. They get wiped away. You don't have to worry about what you did in your past because he says, though your sins were as scarlet, Jesus says, I can wash them white as snow. And once he does that, he now gives you a new weapon. Take a look at what he does. He gives you another arrow. 
But the beautiful thing is, is as you're pulling it back, he wants you to know that this time when you hit, victory is already yours. When I'm in the righteousness of God, when I'm in the right position of God, victory is already mine. It's already set up. When Jesus is in my life, it's a done deal. Wow, what a great message we just heard from our pastor. I'm sure as you're sitting there listening to this, watching this, something inside of you was tugged on. Maybe you were inspired. Maybe God showed you something that you didn't see before. And here at Destiny, we really believe that as God shows us our future, He gives us the steps to take. And if you're watching this today and you wanna know, what's my next step? How do I go for the life that God says I can, I can live? Friend, it starts with following Jesus. It starts with believing that God's one and only Son did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. The gospel is literally the good news that Jesus Christ died for our sins so that we could live and have eternal life. And if you're watching this now and you say, Billy, I'd like to know Jesus. I'd like to start following him as my Lord and Savior. You can do that right here, right now. Yes, as you're watching this, God could be speaking to you. The Bible says in Romans 10 that if we confess with our mouths, believe in our hearts that Jesus Christ died and rose from the dead, we are saved. And so if you'd like to say this prayer, I'm gonna pray right now. I want you to pray this with your heart. Say, dear God, thank you for your son, Jesus. I believe that he died for me, so today I wanna live for him. I believe that he rose again, so today I rise again. Thank you for saving my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, we want to give you some instructions on how to get connected, how to get plugged in. And if you're not around a church locally in your community, we want to encourage you to find a local church. Get plugged in, get involved so that you can take your next step. Hey, here at Destiny, we love seeing people say yes to Jesus. It's one of our favorite moments of every single service. And honestly, that's why we're so generous. That's why we give is to moments like the ones we just experienced right now. And so we're gonna use this opportunity to receive our tithes and offerings here right online with our online campus. And if you're not a part of Destiny locally, but you'd still like to sow financially, this is a great moment for you. The Bible says that we should give as a cheerful giver. And if you'd like to sow financially into this ministry, you can do so by following the instructions in the description. And as always, we love, 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 love to hear stories and testimonies about what God is doing in your life. And so if you're ready to give, follow the directions in the description and we will see you next time here at Destiny.